Hello everybody, welcome to another Virgin Radio classic artist and we've got a special one for you today. I'm dead chuffed to welcome Paul and Andy from Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. How are you doing guys? We're good, thank We're you very much. Uh, no, absolute pleasure. Uh, I mean, we should, we should start off by saying, you know, we're here to talk about, uh, I'm gonna reach down and grab it here. This is incredible, 40 by 40, uh, which yeah. is not only, uh, well, 40 singles, but in 40 years, in 40 years uh, it's 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 one of those kind of proper coffee table. If you can have coffee table box sets, I think mm -hmm. we can. Yeah, I think we can. if we'll have just coined the phrase, uh, it's got books, it's got everything, it's got, it's got like unreleased songs, sessions from the BBC. Yeah, and I mean, that's plus, the lovely thing about it is that is the fact that I'm oh, sorry, can I finish? I was gonna say, and and, and plus. I must say, packaged, uh, packaged yeah. very, very nicely. Indeed. I mean, it's 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 so discreet that you have to have an orange version of it on screen because it <laughs> yeah, to be able, doesn't show be able up. to see it. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the forty singles in forty years are, are great, but it's really about the other content in there that I think our fans will love. You know, there's um, there's all the top of the pops performances. There's Crush the movie for the the documentary you made make, of making the Crush album. Yeah. There is Dazzle um, Ships from Dazzle Hammersmith, Ships. Hammersmith Odeon, 1983. Right. Never been heard before the whole live concert. Yeah. Were, you, were you guys and quite quite uh, meticulous about cataloguing stuff no. as you were doing? No, things? no, terrible, really. <laughs> but, uh, but fortunately, Universal. Well, it was Virgin, then then EMI, and then uh, then Universal. Yeah, um, have have kept everything in their archives. And uh, I mean, one one of the most fun things about doing this project for me was uh, I went down. There's a, a massive archive. Um, uh, EMI archive down by Heathrow Airport, and it's one of those amazing places where, you know, like you see in the movies, uh, the with, the, with, with with the yeah, you have to do this to to get in wow. there, you know, and it's all uh, you know, it's completely hermetically sealed. And that's got sealed presumably like and loads, bomb -proof of, loads of artists. And fireproof. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, hopefully fireproof. Imagine, that, I mean, well, the, thing well, that the, the one in, in New York. Oh, my yeah, goodness, yeah, no. Well, this this is fireproof, and uh, but uh, all the Beatles stuff is in there. Bowie's in there, you know. Wow, Rolling is Star it heavily heavy all, security there? It's a very heavy security. Yeah. It was so, amazing though, because I kept getting these texts and photographs sent to me, going, "Do you remember this?" Do you remember a song called this? And I'm like, sometimes I'm like, yeah, yeah, we need that. And I'm like, no, we need that too. You yeah, know, yeah. The, the yeah. thing was, we, we, particularly in the early days, we used to work linear onto tape. We would write onto tape just weird things and then try and distill out of it melodies and vocals. Right. But sometimes if we couldn't get something to work, uh, there would be something else on the multi-track that might be on the record on the album that would get mixed But then the whole thing would go into storage and we'd never get it back. So it sort of went right. into so the scrapbook Yeah, yeah. Gets, so, gets yeah. so we found all the these ideas leading to the other yeah, idea all yeah. these great little ideas that didn't quite make it But it was it's nice to show people how we worked on things I mean there are about well, eight or nine actually complete songs, songs as well yeah. But wow. it's I think I think people are gonna love all the stuff in there It's the, it's the deeper stuff that I think but is it's always it's interesting to hear a songwriter's journey, to, especially mm, to, yeah. to, to a massive song, you know what I mean? And it's something that you two have, have, have kind of been quite open about. And so it's, it's always interesting to hear mm -hmm. where those seeds were initially planted. And, yeah, yeah. But let's, 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 let's rewind back uh, and go right back to kind of like uh, the early 70s, kind of punk and kind of all of that kind of stuff is happening. And you guys were quite, quite, uh, quite intent on, on, on being the antithesis of, of kind of heavy rock music, weren't you, at the time? Totally, yeah. yeah. So, so, when, so when, when synths first came along, I mean, can you remember the first time you saw a synth or heard well, a synth? Well, the first thing, I, uh, uh, I mean, I was aware that synths existed because, you know, like, there's people like Emerson, Keith Emerson used to use it. You and know? it was the sort of but thing was, like, um, you know, yeah, Buzz Aldrin and, 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 and Neil Armstrong had a rocket. Yeah. We can't afford one of those either. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was it was like synthesizers were just completely beyond our reach. Yeah. But but hearing Kraftwerk on the radio, I think hearing radioactivity. Um, uh, no, sorry, uh, Autobahn's the first thing I heard on the radio. The, the Autobahn single, and it was just this long, kind of how long was it? It was like ridiculously long for a single. But yeah. um, it's, well, not, it's not often you hear music that just sounds like nothing you've ever heard. Before. No, and, and it was really the it first was day. Yeah, first day of the rest of my life, really, and for Andy. As well. And and presumably that was that was it. It's like right, I've got to get me one of those. Yeah, that's the future. Well, that that we 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 wanted to emulate it, but we couldn't afford to. So we started out on our journey with my bass guitar that was the only one I could afford in the second hand shop because it was left handed so I learned to play upside down. Oh my goodness. Paul didn't have anything other than his cannibalised auntie's radios which he cobbled the circuit boards together to just make noises and then we put them through mm -hmm. fuzz boxes and echo machines that we borrowed 
And it was the first six, nine months were just really ambient because that's all we had. We were yeah, just oh, making yeah. noises. And then we finally bought a cheap electric piano and a cheap organ. And that's when we started to actually, he, he started to learn to play writing songs. Yeah. But presumably those, like you say, pulling together those circuit boards and stuff, I mean, that, that must have been a brilliantly creative time because... Yeah, well, it, I mean, electronics was my hobby as a kid, so... And I even went to college to study it and stuff. But, but uh, so I loved I loved building stuff. Yeah, I was going to say uh, if I tried to do that, it'd be an absolute shambles. Yeah, and I used to go around. To, you know, I had a lot of aunties at the time, and I used to go around to their houses and go through the cupboards finding old radios that didn't work, and say, "Can I have this?" Because I want to nick all the parts out of it, you know, to make something. We couldn't else. even afford to go to a radio spare shop and buy transistors. <laughs> he had to steal them out <laughs> of radios. Working class boys from Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. No money. Um, and then. I mean, one, I mean, one thing that's like you, you mentioned there from your, your early sound was that whilst it's very synth, synth led and you could clearly hear the influences of things like Kraftwerk and stuff, but yeah. the fact that you had that drive in bass guitar almost, almost going through a, like an overdrive mm -hmm. kind of yeah. kind of separated you and gave you your, your own unique kind of style, didn't it? It was what yeah. we had, so that was all we could sound like. And um, I think we were saved and inspired by an interview we read with Brian Eno who said if you're young and have no money you've probably got junk shop instruments but you're the only band who's got that collection of particular junk shop instruments that's your sound celebrate it and we were like Brian thank you you've yeah. cleared the way for us to do this so we became junk shop craft work and what was the scene like back then? You know, presumably you weren't on your own in this kind of uh, in this quest for. Well, well we thought we, we were. Thought we were. Right. Was, you know, this was before before the internet. You know, so we had no idea what was going on around the country, really. And uh, you know, our first discovery, really, I think, was the normal that other people were listening to the same thing as us. Daniel Miller, we heard uh, "Warm Leatherette" by uh, right. Daniel Miller. In and Eric's club. In Eric's Liverpool. club. Wow. And, and you, then we, you've got to remember, yeah. we started really in 75, 76 yeah. when we got inspired. Um, in fact, we started this sort of symbiotic relationship that I would go to Liverpool and buy German import albums, but I only had a mono record player. Because Paul had studied electronics, he built himself a stereo. So I had the vinyl, he had the stereo. So we, that brought us together. And then we aspired to start making noises and music. And yeah, we started with, with junk stop stuff. But this was very early on. This was before punk. So yeah. we'd found our alternative before punk. Yeah. But punk opened up the doors to provincial clubs who would allow local artists to come and play and do their own thing. And so, so by... The autumn of 78, we had been to Eric's club in Liverpool a lot, and we finally knocked on the door and said, could we do a gig on your Thursday night free for members audition night? Um, just me and Paul and kind of doing our electronic music. And we thought they'd say no. They said, yeah, what are you called? We went, oh, we haven't got a name. We'll get back to you on yeah, that yeah. one. <laughs> and the name was just written on your wall, wasn't it? It was written on Andy's wall. Yeah, we had a couple of hours to decide what we we're going to be called. And wow. so we rushed around to Andy's house and he used to write, potential song titles on his wall, as, as one does. You know. Famously, it could have been worse because below yeah. Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark was Margaret Thatcher's... <laughs> so I want to talk to you about all that. I want to talk to you about band names. MTA's because, got a ring. Because, yeah, you, so there was that one. And also, Hitler's Underpants. Can we talk about yeah, that as well? Yeah. We've, We've both been in Hitler's, Hitler's Underpants. underpants yeah. How many people can say that? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you and Eva. <laughs> <laughs> um, Very good. Yeah. So... That was a crazy uh, band that didn't last very long. No, I mean... We didn't come up with that name, I hate no, we did. <laughs> that was another loony from the Wirral Peninsula. So, what came first? Was it your first hit or was it Factory Records? Which, which How did that... We... What was remarkable was the speed with which things transformed our lives. Yeah. We were daring to do one gig. That's why Orchestral Manu in the Dark didn't really matter. I mean, it's a ridiculous name. We're stuck with it now for 40 years, but it was for one gig. We were just going to dare to go on stage and not let our mates play guitar and drums all over our electro ideas. We yeah. were just going to do it our way. Mm -hmm. And we had a mate who had a tape recorder and a, and a garage, and we said, can we do a backing track? And so we went and did this one gig, and amazingly, the people at Eric said, oh, we quite like what you did. You're on with a guy who's on Factory Records. They've got, uh, or, or he's he's from Factory. Do you want to go and play at a club in Manchester called Factory? Yeah. So we went. All right. Well, we'll do two gigs. We went to Factory. That's where we met Tony Wilson. Yeah. And then Cheaply we really handed him a cassette. Yeah, gave him a cassette and said, "Can we can we get on? 
Granada Reports because he was a local newsreader right, in yeah. Manchester. Yeah. He filed it in a shopping bag in his car with all the rest of the rejects. And it was only a few weeks later when his wife got in the car, went, what's this bag? And he went, the rejects. And she went, well, Kestrel Maneuvers in the Dark, that sounds cool. What's that? Put it on and went, that's great. You should sign them. And he went, no, no, they, they played at the club. I'm not, it's not my cup of tea. She said, no, really, that's a hit. And so we went, OK, dear, I'll sign them for you. <laughs> that's how you get a 40-year career. Wow. Thank you, Lindsay. <laughs> we owe everything to Lindsay. <laughs> Fantastic. His wife. We were in the junk bag and she fished us out. <laughs> so, I mean, you went from the junk bag to, I mean, to being on one of the coolest labels in the world. Yeah, and it was amazing to sort of do the factory tour. Yeah. You know, we were touring around Britain with, with Joy Division and Certain Ratio, and uh, and it was an amazing experience. What a pioneering tour that must have been. And then, it was incredible. Yeah. I mean, it was... Um, the funny thing was, though, of course, is whenever you turned up at a place, um, the, the lads from Joy Division would go, do you want to be the headline act tonight? And we'd go, no. no. And they go, no, no, you can be. You know, no, no, the fire breather's on, isn't he? We're not going on stage with all the paraffin. We are not being the headline act. Brilliant. <laughs> That's yeah, how we'd be falling there. over on the stage. Yeah, yeah. The factory were, gigs were kind of crazy. They, they, but, they were bonkers. But Tony, it's only, only recently, actually, I was talking to Peter Saville, who, of course, was the iconic sleeve yeah. designer for Factory. And he said, you were actually the only band that fit our original premise, which was we were going to be a development label to develop artists and then pass them to majors, get the money back and plough it back into developing. Yeah. He said, you did exactly what we intended to do. You moved on. All the others stayed, stayed. and we never got rid of them. You know? <laughs> then they made it too comfy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they made it too comfy, exactly. So were, were, you, uh, were you ready for success? Did it, oh, did it, oh, did God, it feel no. like... Did it feel it's terrifying. Like that's really terrifying. I mean, we, you know, we had no aspirations to be, a, a, you know, successful artists or pop stars or anything like that. Was it? Was it? So, uh, you say you say things happen quite quickly. Was it? It was. Was it, was it one of those classic ones where you wake up the you wake up the morning after being on top of the pops and and you can't and you're trying to buy a pint of milk? Was it one of those kind of? Scenarios? No, I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't like sudden that. stardom like that. Like you can't go out the house. But it was just. Yeah, you know, we invented the band to do a one-off gig on October the twelfth, seventy-eight. Then we played. Fa then. Before Christmas, Tony offers us to do a record on Factory. It comes out in May 79. It lands on the desk of somebody who just happened to have been given a new record company by Richard Branson because as a thank you for signing Sting to the Virgin Publishing. <laughs> and she hears it and goes, phones up and goes, um, have you got any more gigs? I went, no, we're... Uh we haven't actually, there's no factory. So well, can I come and hear you? And so she came up and sat on the sofa in Paul's mum's back room where we used to write all the songs. We played our entire set of the seven songs. Private gig for her. You wow. know. And, uh, and she just went, oh, that's great. And she went away and we went, well, that'll be the last we see of her. <laughs> Two weeks later, we're playing in, in Blackpool, Blackpool with, with Joy Division. She's stuck in holiday traffic. It's a Friday night. She arrives as we're loading it. She goes, I've missed you. Oh, well, here, read this on the way home. So we throw everything in the van. I'm in the front. He's in the back holding the equipment it's together. A take, take turns holding the gear. To yeah, stop, yeah. And, stop uh, you know, <laughs> flip the visor down, put the light on and go, right, what's this? Oh, it's a seven album deal. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And that Couldn't was, believe it. That was, that was what, you know, seven months after we did our first gig that was supposed to be a one-off. Which was insane. Really. Um, were you... You know, reading reading through the kind of the various kind of uh, incarnations and and kind of uh, and and whatnot of the band, it struck me that you've always there's been a bit of push and pull towards kind of I guess commercial success and uh, and and I guess artistic kind of creativity. Yeah. Has that been a, a constant kind of niggle? It's um, not really a push and pull. I mean, uh, there's two sides to the band. I yeah. mean, I remember when we switched over from um, from being on Dindisk, which was owned by Virgin, over to the mothership, to, to Virgin Records. And someone said to us, I don't quite understand you, you know, this band. You know, uh, are you Stockhausen or are you ABBA? And, uh, and we both said at the same time, can't we be both? Because yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, that's OMD, really. I mean, we, the, there are certain songs that will... Everything starts as an experiment with us. Even our hit singles will start as an experiment. Yeah. But we'll just keep honing them and honing them and put a tune on until people say, oh, that's a great tune, that should be a single. But all our songs start as experiments, and some we hone up into pop songs, and some we leave as big, you know, abstract, interesting pieces. It must be quite quite fun 
you know, as, as with a lot of bands of that time where you had these really amazingly uplifting kind of pop melodies, like in Ola Gay, for instance, but actually, you know, you get everyone kind of like, duh, 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 duh. and then when they sit down and read the lyrics, they go, oh, hang on a sec, that's about mm. the bombing of Hiroshima. Mm. That, that, was, was that, yeah. that must be quite... It almost feels like you're, you're sneaking, you're sneaking mm -hmm. it in there. It, was, it, it wasn't intentionally no, it surreptitious wasn't. of us. I mean, literally, we would work things up, as Paul said, from audio experiments and then hope we would distill a melody or a lyric out of it. Um, because we like experiments, but we don't like them for their own sake. They have to go somewhere musical. Yeah. Because it has to be worth listening to again. Um, but yeah, Enola Gay was just... I mean, people did actually in a critical way, say, how can you do that? How can you write such a jolly song about such an awful... Such a dark thing? subject. Uh, and, and I mean, it was just, it just turned out that way. I think this mm. is the whole thing about our, our entire career. Certainly in the early days, there was no plan. There was no kind of like, oh, this is, this is going to be the route to be the next big thing. I mean, being a two piece with a tape recorder, playing songs that your mate thinks are in a punk club, called orchestral manoeuvres in the dark was not exactly a You're just asking for a kick in, an, an, yeah, it, was, exactly. it wasn't an obvious plan for world domination it wasn't the recipe it, you know? for that yeah. so it, it, yeah. it's it's always been we did it our way i mean this was amazing yeah. they gave us a load of money and normally you go into a studio and spend it all and you got a couple of reels of tape we thought nobody's going to buy this album so let's build our own studio with when, the money from when the we event. get dropped, then we've got a studio. Then we've got a business. That's classic working class mentality, isn't it? It's, it's well, buy, it is. buy, don't rent. Yeah, yeah. budget yeah. for buy, failure. Yeah, you know. yeah budget so, for failure, yeah. so you've got something. And the incredible thing is, they gave these three kids, us and, um, and, uh, and, and our manager, £30,000 to go and build a studio and record an album. And that's why it sounds like garage punk, because it basically was. Yeah. Yeah. Um, In those days, 30 grand was a lot of money. Nobody, yeah, yeah, yeah. nobody came to listen to it. Nobody a and would it. We delivered it. And the third single, which admittedly we did record, because we realised it was a bit... Mm, um, was a hit. And then the next time, we just we go back to our studio, yeah. we do our thing, then we phone up and say, right, we're going into this studio. And the third album... We were left to our own devices. Did you, no, did you nobody feel told more, us what to do. Did you feel under more pressure as the hits? You know, once you know, the, did you find there's there's two ways of looking at it? That, you know, I've spoken to some musicians where they say hits breed hits. The second you second you you work out kind of work out the formula, it's quite easy to get a hit. Others kind yeah. of crumble and go, my God, I, I wrote this song, it was a huge hit, and then I was just like. Sat there, the only it. time I think we got, we started to become conscious of this and, and worried about our, our sort of commerciality or, or um, was, was after, after the, the failure of Dazzle Ships. I mean, for us, it's a successful yeah. mu musical album, but commercially it was a disaster. And all the albums leading up to that, you know, we just kept having, you know, hit after hit, yeah, yeah. messages and so Ola Gay, kind of Souvenir, the, Joan of Arc. Yeah, and it was a bump in the road. And we, we never felt the real pressure uh, up until after Dazzle Ships. And then, then we suddenly were in this position where, you know, we just bought houses. Um, you were married. I was married. Um, you know, we had a lot of people on the payroll, yeah. the crew and stuff. And all of a sudden, everything was on us to, to kind of keep this business going. And we just had a commercial flop. Yeah. And, and it was at that point we started to feel pressure. Right. But and leading up to that, the first three albums, we felt no pressure. We were just, it was our, our artistic statement. We just kept doing whatever the heck we felt like doing. And, and, and it, selling just, millions. And selling millions, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, um, and, and America was really responsive to you guys. Not later, initially. Later, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the early albums didn't do that. Oh, really? Well. Okay. Yeah. We were signed to, well, we were signed. Virgin didn't have... Virgin, Virgin all over the world, yeah. so they had to license. And what they did was they just they just they just put three bands in a bag and go, here you are. Would you like this? And so we got like we got licensed to Epic in America. Right. I think with Japan and XTC, it was like a grab bag. Here you go. Yeah, yeah. It's like a <laughs> Japan, XTC, bag. and OMD. Cool. And <laughs> Epic had Michael Jackson. They didn't give a damn about some weird yeah. English stuff. So for the first six years, we couldn't get arrested in America. Wow. We were just underground. 
We were and just this weird band with a weird name from England, you know. They, they, they had to kind of contractually put our records out, but they didn't invest. Yeah. We finally made it in America, but the funny thing is, is most of our biggest hits in America weren't that big in Europe. It's like we've got two different set lists. So that's the dream, isn't it? It's kind of like <laughs> well, it is a bit. The dream. It means every, everyone's a winner. <laughs> no, it's bloody <laughs> confusing. <laughs> but it's confusing. We have to do a different show in America than the show we do in Europe. Wow. And, 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 but the, the strange thing is that when people, if, if Americans are like, visiting London, they go, oh, OMD, you're on. They come and see our show and they go, where's all the hits? Where's the hits, yeah, wow. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, one bad, I mean, uh, I think, was it, am I right in thinking, were you due to support Depeche Mode at the Pasadena Bowl? We did. We did, yeah. You did, we did that, the 101 that was their, tour. That was their 101, that was the one that... The, we the, did the whole tour. We did the whole tour, yeah. That must, them. I mean, because that must have been a perfect kind of marriage of, of kind of support act and, and, and main act there because because Depeche Mode really kind of trailblazed that 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 kind of moody electro. Oh, they, they really did. Stadium uh, synth. And, yeah. and on that tour, you know, if we if you leave us a hit in America, so, we, you know, we were we were flying as well. Then. It was strange for us because Vince Clark has told us on a number of occasions that they heard our first single electricity in a club in Basildon and went, we're going to do that. And when he learnt to play almost, he thought, right, I can play synth now as well as Paul Humphreys. Um, and then 10 years later, the band that we had inspired with our first single are um, selling out arenas and stadiums. And we're their support band. And we didn't get into it for the money, but the, the problem was that we were losing a fortune doing that tour and they were earning uh, loads. Enough to retire. So by the time we'd done that tour, <laughs> All the millions of records that we'd sold, we owed Virgin a million pounds. Oh my God. And yeah. not because we were living in castles and buying, buying yachts. yachts yeah. It was just we'd been taking tour support and video costs and blah, blah, blah. And it was just the royalty percentage we were on was so bad. Ouch. That, so we were um, paying back at such a bad rate that we were getting the advances before we paid off the last advance, if you know. Right. So, it, so it was, it was a like strange... A yeah, yeah. yeah like it was a strange loan, thing. Yeah. So at the end of the 80s, sadly, we were under a lot of pressure due to money. Not because we wanted more money, but you can't run a band when you've got none. No. So, so we had to do a best of album to save ourselves financially. Right? Yeah. Mm. And, we I mean, sold millions, but... Just talking about, back to the music, you mentioned kind of like songs like Joan of Arc and whatnot. Mm -hmm. the, how how does your process work when you're writing songs? You say you experiment, but surely there's times where, say, you lead one and or you lead another. I'm guessing uh, that, that the slightly more, I guess, the poppy top lines come from 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 you, Andy. And no, Not is it? Necessarily. Oh, okay. No, it, it, they come they come from various places. It's I just mean. from looking at the live videos. I, you know, Andy likes to strut his stuff and kind of get stuck in. I think. <laughs> no, I mean. I'm, uh, Paul's a little bit more demure than me, and as, he's, as he likes to tell people, I, he, I've spent 40 years overcompensating for his static performance. <laughs> yeah. so. um, no, so. but in terms of writing, you know, we've, we, what, what we like to do is, we like to start with a, a something, a, an abstract idea, a sound, a, a, you know, maybe a lyric, a crazy title of a song or something like that, or or just some sound, we found sound, we've heard some music concrete or something like that. And we need something and we, one of us will just shove it in the room mm. and then we'll just bat it around yeah. until we've made something out Give of it. Give me an idea yeah. of how we make things right. Souvenir. If you think of Souvenir, you will remember ba -da 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 -da, yeah. the beautiful, beautiful melody. Yeah. That started out with Paul helping a friend copy some uh, tape loops of a, yeah. of a, choir, of a choir warming up. Yeah. So By Souvenir up, started yeah. with these tape loops and then the melody and the vocal was distilled out of it. Wow. Same with yeah. Joan of Arc. I just laid down five minutes of me singing A, just going, ah, through an echo. And then just randomly doing A major, playing on a glockenspiel. Then yeah. That was the bed track. Then I went, now I've got a feeling I'm going to try and make a song out of it. So it always starts from the bottom up. Right. It never starts with the tune down. Right, oh, okay. The, That's quite often the melody is the very last thing we put on right. it. Because we'll have done this track, and at the very end, that's when you c can kind of distill out the, the, the melody out of all the harmonics of the things you've done, and you can get the kind of ultimate melody for the song. Has, it, how has, you write, the end. has your writing process changed over the years now that technology has made life easier in terms of oh, right, it's if you need it's to get to a sound, to, yeah. it's, it's just there. You can but just the thing it. is, we call it the tyranny of choice because you know when we first started out, you know we had an organ, a piano.
a little synth, a bass guitar, drum drum box. Is that Winston? That was it. Winston was the tape machine. Tape machine, the tape machine. We also had a little drum box, and and you know that was it. We had to make songs yeah. out of that. Now, bass. <laughs> yeah. Chord. Yeah. Yeah. Melody. Melody. Blip, 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 blip. <laughs> that was it. That was it. Yeah. Job done. Million seller. Job Thank done. you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but but now you, you, we've got all of these plugins and all these digital synths. That, you know that it's endless what you can do. Yeah. My bass drum library has got 457 bass drums. Which one do you want? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we go through <laughs> do, ding, do, boom, the one that boom, we always do. have. Please. Yeah. And, and so you know you've got to kind of you can get lost in your possibilities now. Yeah. And so you've got to kind of, in the same way as a, as a sort of painter um, chooses his colors before he starts, yeah. you've got to kind of do that Lowry, really otherwise. Yeah, you've, got, you've got to be a bit Larry about it. You've got to be Larry about, about it, yeah. I mean, but in terms of the technology, I mean, we start, I mean, the funny thing is we were trying to be the future, but we were actually using a bunch of antique junk, you know, yeah. really yeah. cheap secondhand stuff that was at least 15 years old, if not more. Yeah. But, and it was all hand played. You know, we started before MIDI, before sequences, before computer. It was all hand played. Trying try to sound like a machine, but yeah. that's why the timing is all over the shop. And then MIDI came along, and then drum machines, and then computers. And I mean, now, yeah, you, you, you've got a computer, you can call it all up. I mean, I, I, I like that. A lot of the younger artists who are into retro synths and analog synths, they go, oh, have you still got a Jupiter 8 and a Roland this and a Korg that? And we go, nah. Yeah. They go, well, what do you use on this? We've got the virtual plugins. Yeah. Oh, I can't believe you don't use Sacrilege. the originals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we're like, yeah. Those things never stay in tune, they yeah. weigh a ton to carry around, you can't like sync them. There's a lot of rose tinted specs in, in yeah. Oh, definitely, yeah. yeah. Give I don't me, miss those Give at all. me the virtual <laughs> version <laughs> me every the, day. Give you know. me on a USB stick, yeah. let me plug it in, brilliant. Mm. Um, so, okay, so we're at a stage where you've had your first your first bump in the road. It's, mm. it's getting a bit tense. God, are we still in 1983? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, How long you got? <laughs> um, you you know a lot of a lot of kind of uh, parting of ways and coming back together and parting of ways and then I guess yeah. the first one of my first introductions to you guys was was I think probably sailing on the seven seas when right the, the, and that's when I gone and yeah. then you gone so so to take me through that kind of mm -hmm. that kind of era so Andy okay. you were you ended up being the the kind of you you were you were manning the ship yeah yeah. He was manning the OMD show. We just got exhausted and worn down by the whole thing. So by the end of the 80s, we were struggling. We had different people pulling us apart, different ideas pulling in different it was directions. There divisive elements around yeah. us, which didn't help. No. We, we got together, we'd been writing separately. We got together and we listened to the stuff. And f briefly we went, OK, well, this sounds like two different bands. Well, you have one side and I'll have the other. And went, let's not be stupid. That's ridiculous. That's so stupid, we stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then various reasons we won't go into them. I decided to carry on. It was terrifying because the only person I'd ever made music with since I was 16 was Paul. Yeah. So I felt really anxious, really nervous. The Sugar Tax album that came out in 91 doesn't even mention my name anywhere. I'm kind of like hiding behind the corporate yeah. logo of Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. Um, and yeah, Sailing on the Seven Seas was released and it was terrifying because it didn't chart well and it just crawled up the chart. I was DJing in a, in a, in a Derby nightclub th through that period <laughs> and it was a proper, it was a grower, not a shower and, and it, be, yeah. it became impossible to dance to in a nightclub but it became just such a massive tune. That, I mean, it must have yeah. been a bit of a relief to Oh, well, well it yeah. was because, you know, I, I'd, I mean, we'd had to go through all this legal thing about separating and the value of the name and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was like and, a divorce, really. Yeah. yeah. And what, what was, created what, all what this was, thing together. What was know? really yeah. funny was, I mean, we're too nice to really fall out. Yeah. It yeah. was a bit painful, but yeah. we didn't. I had to go round to Paul's house for some reason to talk to him about, I think the band was going to tour and I didn't have the sounds for some songs. And, oh, yeah, and, and so I came round and he went, yeah, here, here you go. And as I was leaving, he went, Oh, congratulations on Seven Seas getting to number three. I'm glad it didn't get any higher because Souvenir got to number three. <laughs> <laughs> so there was parity. He did it with one hand. <laughs> what was that, what was no. that like for you, though, Paul? Oh, I mean, was it very, been... uh, well, it, I mean, to be Don't honest, lie. It's, it's really, it was really horribly weird yeah. to have OMD out there. This is a, 
you know, we created this baby ourselves, yeah. both mm -hmm. of us, and it, for it to be out there without me being part of it was was weird. was difficult and yeah. weird. And it was weird for him, um, weird for me, because yeah. we we. But know. I was happy that he he had a hit because it meant that you know he was keeping the well, the legacy the, the legacy going yeah. really. Mm -hmm. So what? So after that, one, how did how did you know when did when did uh, you first start winking at each other across the bar again? Well, the thing was was that, you know, when we when you got into the nineties, um, electronic music per se, uh, apart from the, the sort of the dance side of things which kept on kept on going. Electronic pop really was dead. It was consigned to mm. the decade before because, you know, grunge had taken over and, yeah. you know, Brit -pop. Brit pop and all of that. So what we hadn't realized was the 90s signaled the beginning of postmodernism yeah. in music. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it, of course, it became everywhere. But we didn't realize it. We, we were like, at the time. hang on, we were trying to kill guitars. How come they're the future again? What happened to this one? Well, it's music around? cyclic, isn't it? And, <coughs> yeah. and, 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 yeah. and it's like popular we culture started to yeah. eat its own history. Yeah. And, but we didn't realize it. So I stopped in 96 because I felt I was banging my head against a brick wall. Although, Paul had actually co-written something with me on the album that came out, that right. year, the yeah. Universal album. So we were back, friendly talking, and then for the next few you, few years, you know, people started to talk about electronic music and yeah, uh, synth it, pop was getting back in the charts, and so we, we started past getting the asked. millennium. Yeah, we started. People started. To, phones started ringing, and uh, you know, wanting us to 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 get back together and do things, maybe do a concert. And, but it was never quite the right time. Andy was doing his projects, I was doing mine. Yeah. And, and it got to sort of 2005. And um, you know, the phone was starting to ring a lot more by the time of 2005. And he gets a call from a German the TV station saying that- Germany started calling you. Yeah. Wonderful. Because of Germany, <laughs> we, we got back together. Because uh, Germans the, have had a lot of influence on us. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, the Maid of Orleans uh, was was the biggest song in 1982, and they were doing this TV show with the, with the biggest hits over that Great. decade or whatever it was, and they wanted us to perform it. And we, up to that point, we'd always well, we said no to things that came up. But he phones me up and said, "Do you fancy a jolly to uh, <laughs> to Cologne?" <laughs> You know, uh, spend a week in a five-star hotel. We'll have yeah. some fun. You know, and we'll get a chance to see each other. We haven't seen each other yeah. for ages, and um, so we said, "Yeah, okay." And when we just had this weekend together, and um, you know, we worked for four minutes on the on the Saturday, and another four minutes on the Sunday, Brilliant. and we thought, "This is fun, isn't it? Yeah. Should we just do this again?" So that was when it started up again. Yeah. But that's the. the, the, the the validation of, of 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 what you'd done, you know, obviously, like we say, music music cyclic, and 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 what goes around does does generally come around, and you can't hold yeah. a good track down, regardless. You know, we were talking before the camera started rolling about about bands like Nirvana and grunge, but whereas you you strip that back, and the essence of a song is still is still a great song, and like you say, something yeah. like Enola Gay it could could be played. And I'm sure has been played many times. Right. I was watching a video of yours where you're playing it with the with the full orchestra at the, mm, the yeah, last yeah. night of the proms, and it just sounds glorious. You know. I would like to say though, to, just being completely honest, um, I was getting a bit annoyed in the 2000s that we were kind of getting forgotten as a band. There was a right. few electronic bands that were getting forgotten. When people look back at the you know all the big bands of the 80s, it was always you know Duran Duran, Spandau Ballet. It was all those kind of culture club poster bands. Were, were, were the poster bands uh, of, of and Wham and everyone remembered them from the 80s but we sold millions of records in the 80s and no one was talking about us yeah, and it, it, was, it, was, it was it was starting to annoy me really and yeah. so but I wasn't sure if people would be interested we weren't sure if people would be interested in us so when we put some shows on sale we only put nine shows on sale in the UK wondering if there was any interest and those nine shows turned into like 49 shows or something wow and then all of a sudden we were back doing it again but um and how and, and so what are you guys up to now obviously we've got 40 by 40 out what well i mean it's, it the funny thing is is that the band has now been back together in its second incarnation for longer than we were together <laughs> the first <laughs> really? wow. yeah. first That's time true. so um that is amazing we started playing live again and it was fun and but it was noticeable that the vast majority of the audience were people who'd been there the first time yeah after two years we kind of sat down and looked at ourselves and said is this it now are we a tribute band to ourselves yeah. well, there's nothing wrong with that no no there's there is not wrong with but it. the reason why orchestral maneuvers in the dark existed our kind of raison d'etre 
was to do something new, write new music and challenge ourselves to be inspired to do something more interesting than, you know, ooh baby, I love you and the same old chords. Yeah. So we thought, do we dare to actually try to make new music? Yeah. And it's scary because we hadn't done a lot together. We didn't know if people would be interested. And let's be honest, most bands of a certain age only do a new record because they want a new logo on the tour t-shirt. Yeah. And they spend about a week in a studio knocking out any old and calling it a new album. And it's a bad pastiche of their former selves. Yeah. We didn't want that. We were like, if we're gonna do it, Got to go it's gonna in. be great. Yeah. And actually the last three albums we've done have contemporized us. What we notice yeah. now is our audience age demographic is much bigger. People respond to the new tracks and the old tracks. And it seems to have made us more relevant. And as you say, there's nothing wrong with celebrating your catalogue. And, yeah. and go, we enjoy doing that. Well. And, and, you know, certainly, you know, if, you know, we've all been to see bands and they go, oh, and now we're going to do a new track. And everybody goes, right, the bar then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that doesn't happen with us. I mean, we still play the hits, Very good. but yeah. the new material is solid. Brilliant, and uh, I, I can't. We're wait proud to, of it. I cannot wait to get stuck into in, into this. Um, and presumably, it's out now. People can get it everywhere in all the usual. Yep. All yep. the usual places. Fourth yeah. of October, and uh, I mean, there's variations on it as well. There's the box that's got everything in it, but then you you can just purchase other other. There's the vinyl version. There's the uh, there's the the CD version. Brilliant. But um, the box. It's just got so much stuff in it that, that, you know, from all the hits right down to the stuff that never got released, the yeah. weird stuff. So it, it's been it's been wonderful to do it. But you know what? That's just where we stand now. We're still going forward. Yeah, perfect. There's a lot of energy left in this band. I so can tell. I can a lot tell. of life left in it. I can tell. Musical Viagra. Uh, <laughs> and like Paul, that. thank you so much, guys. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Virgin Radio Classic Artists. Thank you. My oh, pleasure. Thank you. The Chris Evans Breakfast Show and the best music, Virgin Radio.